Greetings, everyone, and welcome back to Tiano, the last of Europe, of course you know. Um, and it's uh, basically, you know what this is all about now. Um, we've got some comms to go through, such as, I would keep Imperiousness low, because of the ba increased base stimulation, it seems better than the other rewards, so, hmm, maybe we should. Also, maybe your project in Baja is finished. Um, you get a reward for the project in the video, with one being minus 20% unemployment. So I looked over, and it's still going on. We're actually now building it. It only takes 900 days. Basically, 900 more days. 800 some odd. You know what it is, what it is. Another comment was, Mexico would, would not be itself without never-ending crises. Lopez's Mateo's term has ended, and now it's Ordaz's job to end the doctor strike. And someone says, can you please show how the world is looking at the moment? Now let's look-see. So, we have the OFN here. Uh, that part. Uh, ooh. Gross Afrikanisches Reichstadt. Not good. Organization Free Nations with uh, good old South Africa. Oof. Um, Einheit's Pact is looking pretty okay-ish for now, pretty normal. Oh, of course the UK, is, or <clears throat> Great Britain, is in the Organization of Free Nations as well. Um, the Japanese sphere is looking pretty big, so, and the OFN down here too. But yeah, yeah, it looks pretty normal. It's only 1965, February, so. But we have the little president. We both know well of the long broken state of federalism, but the party is to survive in the latter half of the century. The central leadership in the CEN must be strengthened. The governors corrupt the leadership through careerism and nepotism. Carlos Madrazo never once doubted his friend Loro Ortego's, Ortega's ability to serve the revolution. As a new party leader, Madrazo had taken plenty of time to both discuss and reflect on the advancement of the revolution. Ortega supported his cause since his entry into national politics. Even though widely different backgrounds both felt a sense of solidarity with each other, keeping unwavering loyalty to the cause of preserving the revolution. Agreed, but you must remember that it isn't only the governors. The CTM, CNC, and CNOP are a larger threat, and they are near impossible to eliminate. Loro Ortega spoke skeptically, but even still, his eyes burn with commitment. Indeed, that is true. Just let me skim through my notes, reviewing, but draws only then realize how far they'd come with their plans. It asked for this meeting to be about general ideas, not specifics. Thinking about it, they had already sat here for most of the day. Even now, a ray of orange sunlight shone through the window. It was stunning. Dividing our reforms into two parts will let us tackle problems one step at a time. Our first reform uh, should be centralizing the party by returning authority to the CEM and granting us more political power. The second reform will attempt to democratize the party by selecting candidates via a primary system and removing power from the corrupt oligarchs and careers. What do you think? Wonderful. Should we get into the details tomorrow then? So here we are at doing what we can, but we have a bright future ahead of us. At last, as the version set off by these uppity doctors that have been done away with, the doctor strike is finally nearing its end. All the better, Ordaz was finally getting rather patient, wanting to focus instead on proper governance and bringing the United Mexican States to a bright future they deserve. Some of the cabinet, a set of meetings will now be held to draft the, or define the future plans of the Ordaz administration. In this manner, <clears throat> Mexican prosperity shall be built ever higher, and the steady hand will prove itself as the best possible guide for the Mexican Revolution and Institutional part, Revolutionary Party. Cool. 21 days, and then what? Establish IMP. It's not bad. Sea of Tehuantepec. It's not bad. Modernize Pemex. The Car Caracas Connection. It's not bad. More GDP growth. I like that. Stabilize development. Inflation will decrease by 0.4. Ooh, that's strong. Ooh, we do need this one. Everything will. The Olympian spirit. The Olympics, the marvelous global event which President Lopez Mateos engaged in backbreaking labor to secure, are coming to Mexico in 1968. Sure, it might only be the 1960s, but now is the perfect time to begin laying out plans and preparing the venues. We cannot waste any time. It's a perfect opportunity for two things to prove the glory of Mexico to the wider world and show our respect for the hard work left behind by President Mateos. And we also want the uh, loyalty here to increase, so. The guest list. President Ordaz sat at home with First Lady Guadalupe Borja. Discussing his favorite work, or subject, subject work. <clears throat> Specifically, he was going over plans for the banquet to be held for the, to, for the PRI's upper echelon. But the venues have decided upon the uh, Chapultepec Castle, he said with some excitement. The catering will be handled by a top-tier restaurant, and you can help me decide which one. The guests of honor will be my cabinet secretaries, the party leadership, and all living former presidents. As you heard the last part, Guadalupe Fran, will the wives of former presidents be invited as well? Why, of course, why do you ask? Well, at her last meeting, Eva Samono was very rude to me. Uh, or Daz smiled sympathetically. I'm sorry, dear, I didn't know. If you'd like, I can talk to Adolfo about that. Hopefully she'll be more polite at the banquet. <clears throat> Frankly, I prefer she didn't come to the banquet at all. 
Ordaz's brow froze and considered his wife's request. Lopez Mateos wasn't exactly close with his wife. In fact, Ordaz knew the ex-president had been pursuing other women for years. Still, Adolfo needed to maintain his public image. Attending this event without Ava could be embarrassing, and Ordaz didn't want to ask that of his old friend. We can't exclude her completely. Even the first wife has to take uh, some responsibilities and deal with stuff, too. Because we're a team. That's right. Union's gaining momentum, huh? Well, hopefully not too much. Oh, good. Mobilize a DFS. That's a cruise invades Bolivia. Oh, look at that. And a bright future head, indeed. Grand projects. At an upscale restaurant in the La Codesa, President Ordaz was enjoying dinner with his wife, Guadalupe. It was a rare evening alone for the couple, with no presidential duties to attend to, and all their children busy elsewhere. And after the cabinet meeting, Ordaz joined on, I sat down with Torres Landa, the governor of Guanajuato. They reported on his pet project, Plan Guanajuato, to develop infrastructure and build an industrial corridor. I'll admit, I was very impressed. Guadalupe smiled, not as all surprised that her husband was still talking about his work. You shouldn't let a governor outshine you, dear. There are plenty of other major infrastructure projects left undone. For example, this city still lacks a metro system. A metro system in Mexico City, uh, Ordaz asked, scratching his chin. It's certainly grandiose, and I'm not sure that it's feasible. But it is feasible. The civil engineering firm's a Empresasas. Empresas, ICA. My brother works here, remember? Uh, had a proposal for just a system. They said dramatically reduced traffic construction could be completed before the Olympic Games. The president was intrigued. Given that the capital metro system would be a major victory for his administration, especially if it was finished before the Olympics. Uh, he vaguely recalled the idea of being raised during Lopez Mateos' term, but opposition from the federal district's region had defeated it. Ordaz uh, resolved to look into the matter himself. <clears throat> An opportunity to transform the capital. Alright, so what do we got here? How much debt do we have? Oh, I got plenty of space. Uh, base stimulation like that. Stadium. Better unemployed. It's not bad. 500 days. New nuclear plant. 2%. Whoa, that one. Off to the races. Things are stable, gentlemen, but we've only just begun. President Gustavo Diaz Ordaz stood at the end of a long conference table. All right, before him was his cabinet, the herd of men who had enacted his vision and governed by his command. Many were friends, some rivals, and others were just plain useful. Ours is a great nation, uh, built by its people and institutions. Ordaz continued to his captive audience, however. I wish to maintain order and ensure Mexico's prosperity. Each and every one of us must work hard. We all have our jobs to do, and I expect the best. I expect initiative and perseverance. You know, it was my own work as cabinet secretary that earned Mateos' respect and friendship. Or does let the rate of his statement settle. Ordaz became president not just through hard work, but because he was the smartest and most ruthless man of the PRI. He only had one term as president of Mexico, and he wouldn't let, others, let other men be his downfall. He would use their ambition to his benefit. Ordaz keenly observed as secretaries Del Rosal, Campos Salas, and Manautu each perk up at his not so subtle hint. He knew they wanted what he had, they wanted to be the next El Tapado. Each man before Ordaz was there for a reason. They were all running to be the same goal, the same finish line, but it was not lost on any of them that it was a competition. Politicians and bureaucrats are all jockeys of their own talent, gathered here by horses of different shapes. Whether intelligence, charisma, or strength, each man would have to utilize their advantages. So, a long one, the race began. Now, gentlemen, we have a lot of work to do, so let's get started. Ordaz finished his impromptu lecture with a well-practiced, lopsided smile. Each man applauded and began preparing their reports. One by one, they would stumble over themselves to prove their virtues. All the while, Secretary of the Interior, Luis... Uh, Echeverria Alvarez maintained a polite smile, keeping his cards close to his chest. Each man will jockey for the position in his own way. Oh, we get bureaucrat low T2 here. Oh, look at that. Beautiful. Oh, I'll do this one next to you. Uh, oh, we can either do Museum of Insurgency, more space simulation, or more simulation of Leon Stadium. This is cheaper, but this gives you more faster. Detailing Miguel Hidalgo's struggle in the fight for Mexican independence, the museum would allow residents of Augusto Calientes to learn more about their origins of the Mexican state, as well as the role their state played in the insurgency and would surely be home to many school trips and tourist stops in the city. Last word. An article published in the most recent edition of El Trimestre Economico, the oldest journal of economics in the country, uh, is garnering a lot of attention. Given its politically seditious nature, the government has been forced to take notice. The author, one of Raul Salinas Lozano, argues in favor of the protectionist policies he implemented to grow Mexican industries. Specifically, he focuses on a rule requiring that all cars sold in Mexico contain components manufactured domestically. Using the most recent data available, he argues this policy was a major success. 
Salinas then addressed the news that this rule will soon be repealed. He explained the damages its removal will do to the Mexican economy, and he lays the blame squarely on President Ordaz. He, aimed, he ends the article with an also subtle attack on the president, implying that he's letting personal grudges override the national interest. Although the most economic journals have some little circulation outside of academia, this article has gained some serious, um, a serious following. University students and the educated middle class have latched onto its message, especially its critique of President Ordaz, for many. It confirms the previously held beliefs about the current administration's pettiness and ineptitude. Hasn't that snake done enough damage already? And had a loss for words. At the morning after the PRI banquet at the Chapultepec Castle, President Ordaz sat glumly in his office. When a call came in, he surprised his predecessor on the other end. I'd like to apologize for how my wife behaved last night, Lopez Mateos began solemnly. <clears throat> Ordaz let out exasperated sigh, it's okay, mine was just as bad. Uh, hmm. While the two presidents had greeted each other warmly at the evening, Eva Samando and Guadalupe Borgia exchanged only terse good evening. Were still, despite being seated close together, they didn't speak to each other at all for the rest of the night. Oh boy. Their husbands repeatedly tried to draw them into a shared conversation, but uh, no avail. Well, Duffo, at least the dinner's over now. We can put that embarrassment behind us. Um, Your Excellency? Lopez Mateos has said sheepishly, you might want to read through the morning edition. Oh boy. Uh, Ordaz felt a stomach flip. He looked through the newspaper on his desk. The journalists at the banquet had reported on the two women's behavior. Some had been so bold as to speculate about the cause of their apparent feud. What was supposed to be a simple dinner party turned into a minor public relations disaster. Public slip-ups can be costly. Base stimulation goes up, but you're like, better... Yeah, I mean, why would you not choose to attract American investors? Ooh, that's also really good, too. This is better, is it? So we wanted this one, where would we put it? Central North? Moderately active? Okay. Very active, oh look at that, that's nice. Danger in the desert, before we get to drinking I have a couple words. The Grupo Popular Guerrero has never been stronger force for justice. Many newcomers have joined us, and Sebadillas police have <clears throat> generously donated the weaponry to the cause of socialist revolution. Arturo's Gamiza's words were met with nervous chuckles and a jackal's howl from across the Durango border. Jacobo stepped forward beside his brother, but our successes have aroused the enemy from their stupor. The Ibarra families called for the aid of their Cadillo comp uh, compadres. Roberto Jimenez and Emilio Rascon, brutes and oppressors both, they also managed to bring in the 67th Infantry Battalion. We're enough of a threat now that the Federales are after us. Amidst the whispering, uh, uh, resulting whispers, Captain Salvador Gaetan stood up. I've served with the military, and you're louder more than their match. They're well armed, sure, but the troops aren't allowed to have minds of their own. Otherwise, they'd realize what crap they're fighting for. You can all think, have to think, so here's the plan. We attack both groups while they're separate and wandering in the desert. Think you can take them? Both well, began to call it the terrain where such traps can be set tactics. To lure the Cadillos or military forces where forward without the counterpart. Salvador. Not at long for a time before leaving the rest to Arturo and Jacobo. Isora Maria, lurking near the fringes of the camp, she nodded as he led her out into the twilight of the desert. I need to take a message back to the Cebadilla. Pay my brother to visit and tell him to get ready. If he won't listen, tell him his career is already over after we hit the police station. She laughed as the jackal howled again. It was over the moment you joined the true revolution. Then her face grew serious. I'll get moving before dawn. Do you have any technicians? American contracts. Mateus' dream. Practical realities. Huh. Once for freedom, well, we're going to do this one. Stabilize development. The past decades have seen major fluctuations arising from economic growth and inflation. If things carry on like this, the average Mexican civilian will be unable to purchase the basic necessities of life. If that carries on long enough, the integrity of this institutional revolution itself falls into question. President Ordaz will ensure inflation is controlled by governmental policy. Done correctly, those will ensure that economic development remains smooth and that the flourishing middle class's wages are not devoured by inflation. In effect, it will be a continuation of stabilizer development and the major economic growth of recent years. How's life treating you, President Mateos? Ordaz smiled at the former president, of course. The two busy men's meeting had been pre-scheduled, but Mateos was so enraptured by his work that Ordaz could sneak up on him. Fantastic, President Ordaz. Mateos chuckled at their shared joke. Few people on Earth understood the stress of the job, so camaraderie was appreciated. The two men had plenty of ups and downs, but now that the baton had been passed, any lingering animosity dissipated. Mateos got up from his desk arrayed with documents and plans for future Olympic endeavors. It's been invigorating to dig into one project so thoroughly. The presidency never allowed me to focus on the minutia. It led Ordaz to a set of comfortable chairs. He pushed open a double-pane window, and the room filled with the sounds and smells of the city. 
The sun was bright on the light showered past just hours before, evaporating the hot streets below. The 1968 Olympics will show the world the greatness of the city and our people, Mateo started excitedly. The plans that the committee has drafted are already all astounding. It will be the culmination of all of our hard work. The problem, as it stands, is that our currently allocated budget might not be enough to follow through with our plans truly. I'm thrilled to have you lead this project in an uncharacteristically uncharacter relaxed manner, or Da sink into the plush lounging chair. It was relieved to see his friend doing so well. You, uh, you have everything you need, I promise. Mateo sat down from across his former protege and current successor. He glanced out of the open window to the activity below. This will be my final gift to the people. The future of Mexico is as bright as Olympic flame. The promises I've made to the people are not limited by any conditions. Look at that. We still have the doctor strike, so. Second aftermath. So. We have game momentum. What do we need to be at? 50 and 30. Anything with that or below, we'll be okay with. Good. We may not see any pressure to that is illegal or convenient. Alliance for Freedom. The Alliance for Freedom is a major support of liberty in America, which is all the more given the ongoing conflict with the subversives in the pay of Germany, Italy, and Japan. Fascist proxies wreak havoc throughout the free West in the form of scums like Trujillo. Uh, Trujillo. Support from this institution is something that the United Mexican States stand to benefit strongly from. Accordingly, President Diaz or Daz will address an event of the AFF and along the way build connections within the U.S. Iron Convictions. Licenciado Orochurtu, or does begin, please have a seat. The regent of the federal district stated the man across from him. The president was an ugly specimen, lacking both charisma and imagination. His deficiencies as leader were one of the many reasons Orochurtu had supported Salinas Dalzano's presidential bid. As you know, Mexico City will be hosting the Olympic Games in 1968, and the district will need more modern infrastructure to accommodate them. I believe it's time to build a metro system. Orochutu scowled his default reaction whenever Metro was mentioned. Your Excellency, I must caution against this idea. The Federal District cannot afford a Metro, and it's not the most effective way to reduce traffic. I think you've mistaken. I've read the ICA report myself, and their models for traffic reduction seem reliable. As for the cost, or Dasmad, you don't need to worry. I'll support the construction with as much Federal funding as necessary. The President thought this offer was generous, but Orochutu remained unconvinced. After years of opposing the Metro, his reputation was on the line, and he had a duty to protect his allies in the transport unions. I'm sorry, Your Excellency, I cannot support any proposal that includes the metro system. Or does a small advantage, giving his defiant subord subordinate a stern look, he replied, if that's all I have to say, then you may leave. This isn't over. It is by far very, very far from over. Suspected change. And that's why I've called you here today. For several months, Licenciado Ortega and I have drafted the first phase of our plans for the party, the full extent of which I'll share with you now. The crowd in the room sat patiently, listening to Madrazo's speech, waiting for its critical points. For Madrazo, the only important man in this conference was President Ordaz. His cold, stale gaze mildly terrified him. Even if he had significant power, he could never override his superior. The first order of business would be to reduce the power of the governors within the party and return power to the CEN. Secondly, the CEN will authorize investigations that should expose and eliminate careerism. Following that, we also send representatives to the local party committees to connect them to the CEN and hear the concerns. Finally, we're beginning to eliminate corrupt careerists from the party and cutting networks of revisionists. Ordaz's still face quickly turned skeptical upon hearing the last sentence. I can understand your concerns about corruption, and I'll support your fight to end it, but I should warn you before trying to make systematic changes. I have a strong belief in your ability to reform, but trust me when I say don't go too far. Madrazo looked towards Ortega with concern. It wasn't ideal, but they both knew they had to tread lightly. Turning back to face Ordaz, he replied, well, keep that in mind. The next generation. After a full day of meetings and presidential briefings, President Ordaz was exhausted. He wanted nothing more than to be left alone in his office, but there was one more person he had to see. Uh, uh, Colonel Supo, the highly effective program created by Lopez Mateos's, or Lopez Mateos, had to provide subsidized food for poor families, was in need of a new head. The replacement had already been selected, some up-and-coming former congressman from the state of Mexico. The meeting would be the last formality before the official appointment. Welcome, Licenciado Carlos Hank Gonzalez. Or does begin? That's an interesting name you've got. My father was born in Germany, he replied, completely unfazed. So why do you want to be head of the Conasupo? Hank Gonzalez looked at Ordaz right in the eye. Your Excellency, my only desire is to serve the people by providing food to the needy. Winning this essential program is a great responsibility and one that I do not accept lightly. 
or does raise an eyebrow. He doubted that this ambitious young man still only had noble reasons for wanting such a high office still. He is supportive of the party, he would probably run the program competently, even if he did influence some peddling on the side, well, there very well, Hank Gonzalez, the position's yours. The PRI is always in need of new blood. Hank Gonzalez, hmm. Hmm. Slightly unproductive, huh? Slightly productive. How much debt do you have? 48, well, we can do it here. Looks good to me. The land dispute in a stuffy meeting room in the Palacio Nacional. President Ordaz was struggling to stay focused. He took his presidential duties very seriously, including paying attention during cabinet meetings. Yet, hearing the same issues discussed day after day grew tiresome very quickly. Look at this one. <clears throat> Thank you for your report, Secretary Echeverri. He said, as the Secretary of the Interior finished explaining the state of internal dissent, is there anyone else here who has something to share? General Alfonso Corona del Rosal, the Secretary of the National Patrimony, sprang to his feet and placed a map in front of the President. Your Excellency, I've received reports from the geological conditions in the area, he said, pointing to the mountains in the southeast of Oaxaca. Oaxaca, are ideal for a new oil field. My partners in the Pemex are eager to begin exploring or exploratory drilling. Or Daz's eyes, eyes lit up as he followed Del Rosal's finger. It was a refreshing to be presented with new opportunity instead of another problem. Boop. Boop. Seated behind the president, Luis Echeverria frowned. I'm familiar with that area. It's just outside the Salina Cruz. The local Ejido is in the midst of a fierce property dispute with a landowner, complicated by the fact that the peasants are indigenous. Well, uh, Kakekiu is mestizo, rushing in to drill that for their oil could activate the situation. Del Rosal scoffed. A couple of angry peasants won't cause us any trouble. Need I remind you, Licenciado Echeverria, that I am a general with combat experience. I am perfectly capable of securing the area. Gentlemen, please calm down or die so quickly. I think we can all agree that it was best if Del Rosal goes ahead with his plans. Resolves the dispute first. Resolve the dispute. That's probably the best way to do it. Less stimulation. Um... I don't want to lower stimulation. Quality of life goes up, which is nice. Get more stability, too. Are we losing weekly stability? Yeah. The southeast. Uh... Oh, stimulation doesn't get affected. Oh, okay. Oop. There we go. And even Kyo. It was well past one, but the Secretary of Hacienda and Public Credit, Antonio Ortiz Menya, had already decided to take a late lunch. From his office, he continued the project he'd been working on for the past six years, managing deficits, controlling inflation, maintaining party yearly growth, stabilizing development as it was known. Uh, Secretary Menya called one of his aides. A Secretary Campos Salas would like to speak with you. Until I'm busy, he hopped. For all that, he stayed the same under the Dows or a few changes that irked him. He would have been happy to chat with Salinas Lozano, but the new Secretary of Industry and Commerce was far too smug and combative for Menya's taste. Secretary Menya said another aide approaching the desk. I have that report on the national debt you requested. Menya stopped what he was doing. Leave it here, he said grimly. There was no surprises in the report, and that was a problem. Another thing that has stayed consistent throughout Lopez Mateos' sexenio was ballooning deficits. So far, our Dawes hadn't seen fit to cut spending at all. On the contrary, he would soon be spending more to prepare for the Olympics. And it couldn't last. As an economist, Mena knew this Mexican miracle was coming to an end. Yet, so long as he held his office, he spent every day trying to keep it going, at least a little bit longer. Freedom tractors. Huh. It's not bad. Northern Harmony. We strike strikes. Strikes have held back economic growth and discouraged foreign allies from investing in us. The doctors have, despite all the forbearance we have shown, begun to strike yet again. Obviously, this is defiance cannot be borne for much longer. Decisive action must be taken now. Before the strikes encourage others into getting odd notions of strikes with being within the rights of Mexicans, we must restrict further labor organizations outside of the authorizations provided by the Institutional Revolutionary Party. In addition to preventing any repeals of the AMMRI's subversion, it also strengthens the legitimacy of the revolution in the eyes of the Mexican worker. Some fancy new toys. I still can't believe they just walked straight through the canyon, said Arturo, gesturing towards the bound soldiers. Now moved to a forest clearing, you think they'd at least send someone to scout ahead. I guess that's beyond the kind of person dumb and luckless enough to get drafted, said Jacobo. By the Virgin, even Yemen's guys put up a better fight than this, and they had a handful of shells between us. Ooh. Boop. <clears throat> between them. Well, I guess even Hacienda's must pay better than our noble armed forces. Could probably spare the poor guys a couple more bullets, though. Well, uh, but that's where you're wrong, my silly Yuki. Jacobito, don't you hear? The Hacienda system was disbanded decades ago by our wise and benevolent governing institutions. 
Since then, her poor, starving landlords have been barely able to afford food, let alone ammo for hard guns, both brothers left. Still, the boy heroes over there are carrying some pretty fancy equipment. If only the men were worth the guns they carry. Now what are we going to do with them? I blindfold them and cut them loose, I guess, said Arturo. Um, they're more useful to us as public embarrassment than they are dead. Don't want to attract too much heat too soon. Especially since their capabilities have just expanded greatly. Soon it'll be time for a little more ambition. It can't be this easy. The kickoff. All right then, said Avery Brundage. The president of the International Olympic Committee, let's get started with this presentation. <coughs> yes, that said, Mexico City's Olympic organization, organi Organizing Committee's Executive Head, Jose de Jesus Clark Flores, starting off. We still don't have a proper chairman, but I have been directing a good section of the work to our finance vice chairman, Licenciado Agustin Legoreta, and our building vice chairman, Pedro Ramirez. Licenciado Ramirez. Boop. Uh, thank you, said Pedro Ramirez Vasquez. As the lights dimmed, they turned on the projector. The first thing the organizing committee did was to start scouting possible locations for the games. And I think we have made very good progress in this regard. He changed slides with his words. This is our main stadium, part of the National Autonomous University of Mexico, and what Frank Lloyd Wright called the most important building in modern America. We just need to expand it and have a place for the opening and closing ceremonies. Pre-existing, that's great, said Abrundic. Are there any more buildings we can use? Ramirez smiled and switched sides. This is Estadio Azteca, which is in Mexico City, but I'll have a higher crowd capacity when it opens, so we'll hold the football so soccer matches there. That's my design, by the way. He starts flicking through the slides. The soccer tournaments will be held around the country to lighten the load. El Capulco will hold most of the sailing events. I have a line on the Palota and tennis facilities. There's a few locations that we could convert for the manor sports. That leaves us swimming, rowing, basketball, and the villages. Plus the preparations for the Contra Olympi Olympiad. There's more, said Brundage. My phone's been ringing all day and night about the possibility of high altitude will cause the athletes to suffer. We need to have a sporting event in October with a few athletes to put this idea to rest. You better have something ready by then when we get there. No time to waste. Mm. Equity or simplicity? Let's just get with this done then. I don't expect a hard mission, as, long, as you might already know. Land disputes are very common occurrences around these parts. Please don't make it any harder, Sebastian said with an apathetic tone. <clears throat> Of course, my friend, I'm here to help a fellow revolutionary. I do not intend to complicate your work, replied Diego. Oh, Diego, yeah. Sebastian made an annoyed expression of the PRI representative as they entered the large hall where two peasants sat. He wasn't surprised when that the Egito's men didn't seem to care about professional attire. Based on their style of clothes, they seemed to look like they just came from a 16-hour workday. Mr. Garcia, I see you're claiming land east of uh, Villa Flores, which overlaps that of Mr. Sanchez. Looking at the size of your land, I consider your Egito very wealthy, Mr. Garcia. Sebastian still, still sounding mundane. That would be true, Sebastian. Then my proposed solution is that you pay Mr. Sanchez between two th to 3,000 pesos. What do you think? This proposal is outrageous, Diego exclaimed. The PRI never caves to the current measures of conspiring revisionists. This fight for the revolution represents equality, unity, and the Mexican independence. We should not be thrown away to solve problems like this. I serve the revolution, the legacy of General Obregón, and the Institutional Revolutionary Party. The CEN didn't extend me here without reason. I will only accept an equitable solution of equally distributed land. The three men looked at Diego with confusion and cluelessness. He thought his speech was great, but clearly it wasn't very convincing. He sat down and Sanchez turned to Sebastian and said, I think 2,500 pesos is a fine offer. That's, what, that's right, the military option. Ooh, cede any pressure that is illegal and inco inconvenient. The legislative approach. The promises I have made to the people are not limited by any condition. Sabsha Asa. Money trees. Ooh. Less stable crops, more cash crops. Trickle-down agriculture, our loyal bulwark. I like to restrict strikes. First. Pan o palo. Ordaz Carillo uh, Flores and the Ambassador Freeman sat under a row of fan palms in the garden of the National Palace. <clears throat> in a few hours, they would go to the Alliance for Freedom Summit where Ordaz would be speaking. For now, they would enjoy a short break and talk about future commitments. I think you should take a strict stance, the American said. A greater commitment to intel sharing, renewing arms and equipment deals, that sort of thing. I think I could talk Washington into sending more instructors to the DFS. It's not that I disagree, Carrillo Flores replied, but we should be aware of treating symptoms rather than the illness. Fascism is not violence for its own sake, it is an ideology that feeds off deprivation and destitution. More funding uh, to direct towards developmental programs would discourage people from turning to dangerous radicalism in the first place. The American diplomat nodded politely. He wasn't convinced. <clears throat> Ultimately, it was Ordaz's choice to make. If you press the Americans, he could secure funding for Flores' development program. It would, however, come at the expense of increased security cooperation. It would do them no good to plan for the coming decades if the DFS was unable to combat fascism today. 
Rodaz adjusted his glass and said, Afraid I must agree with Licenciado Flores. Momentary aid is more pressing concern. We would welcome any opportunity to strengthen security cooperation. What is the DFS? Do we need more DFS loyalty? Ooh, yes we do. Versus what? Worker and peasant loyalty. Workers? Peasants. Oh, they're fine. We have to go with the DFS. No. More imperiousness for now. I still have 23%, it's not bad. The snake's compassion. Late in the evening, after most of his staff had gone home, Luis Echeverria sat in his office working. Filing away documents, he kept coming back and report on conditions in Roaxaca. The spat he had with General de la Rosal in the last cabinet meeting was still on his mind. His enemies might call him a schemer, a snake, but in his own way, Echeverria cared about the people of Mexico. He thought of Egitos, like the ones outside Selena Cruz, as the foundation of the PRI. And the nation. It made his blood boil when men like del Rosal treated them as little more than obstacles to be pushed aside. Suddenly the phone rang, it was a call I'd been waiting for. That's in Seattle, Echeverria. We've finished an investigation, you ordered. Turns out that the landowner of Oaxaca has a bit of making indigenous villagers disappear. The people in the Ejito were scared, off of, scared of us at first, but once we explained our intentions, they agreed to testify against him. He's now under arrest for murder. Excellent, thank you for letting me know. <coughs> As Echeverria hung up the phone to let us sigh of relief, he'd already spoken to Oaxaca's governor about the land dispute. With that cacaquiu out of the way, it was sure to be resolved in the village's favor. That would provide them with some protection from Del Rosal's schemes, but it might not be enough. Was he really content to leave things like this? Struck by sudden inspiration, Echeverria picked up the phone again. Hello, please connect me to the Department of Tourism. Can help come from help can come from unexpected places. Freedom tractors. I like to improve agriculture too. This is important, don't get me wrong. Petroleum Institute. Loyalty will increase. The oil wells. More loyalty is always good too. I like that get more growth. But you don't get to use it for very much. I want to get rid of... Ooh, actually, it gets better, though. Stimulation's not bad. I want to get rid of these guys as fast as possible, though. There's only 0.15% growth, so... Freedom Tractors. The Alliance for Freedom, in addition to supporting the free U.S. politically against the threats posed by international fascism, also provides economic support to friendly states. One of the most notable examples is this of agricultural mechanization efforts in neighboring Central American states. Mexico stands to benefit from this program, and President Diaz Ordaz understands this very well. He will leverage AFF funding and expertise in order to support mechanization projects throughout the United Mexican States. Breaking the region's hold, Ernesto Orochorto has defied my will, Ordaz said to the select groups assembled in his office. I cannot build a metro system while he remains a federal district's regent. I'm going to get rid of him, I just need to know how. Your Excellency, if I may, said Emilio Martinez Man Manautu, Secretary of the Presidency. For all his faults, Orochorto has served the party loyally for many years. We could offer him a position or promotion to some other office where he cannot interfere. A reward hardly seems appropriate for so and so insubordinate, Luis Echeverria, Secretary of the Interior, interjected. What we should do is have the DF DFS dig up some dirt on Orochorto. Then we confront him with this dirty laundry and force him to resign quietly. Mantau Manaltu turned pale at the suggestion. With all the due respect, Secretary Echeverria, can you think of something less immoral? Echeverria thought for a moment. There's an even simpler solution. The region needs support from the city's transport unions to keep things running smoothly. If we pull full strings and get them to a strike, we can tarnish his image. That would justify a dismissal. And not for does it suddenly. All of your ideas have merit, but we only need one plan. I'll make the final decision. Promote him. Order the DFS to locate him or investigate him. Stir up trouble among the transport unions. I kind of like this one. Promote him out of the way. This way he gets a he gets something nice up for him. Nothing bad happens to him. Let's see what happens. Report on continuing GPG mobilization. Issue Organization of the GPG in the Northwest Chihuahua to Commander Gutierrez Barrios. Today, a group of soldiers from the 5th Military Zone who were on patrol in the municipality of Madeira were ambushed by paramilitaries believed to be from the Grupo Popular Guerrero GPG. Despite some light casualties of the three wounded, a considerable amount of equipment was stolen from them, including weaponry and a radio. Wow. It has been known for several months the group was leaning in a more militaristic direction. This attack has marked a worrying change in tactics for the organization. Pre previously, the terrorists had contented themselves with small-scale robberies and attacks on landowners and prominent locals. However, since leader Arturo Gámez García declared it would cease non-violent activity to bring about a social state, the GPG has transformed itself from a paramilitary wing into a guerrilla army, recruiting followers and arming themselves. A source indicates some of their elements have begun ta taking to the Sierra Tarahumara to train and hide weapons. 
The local authorities are already worried about this trend, fearing the GPG could begin targeting officials. On the state and federal level soon, my team and I share their concerns. It is my informed belief that allowing the GPG to continue down this path could turn them into a real threat, judging from recent experiences with Cuban and Paraguayan guerrillas, as it could destabilize the region severely and threaten order. We've already begun several operations with the aim of infiltrating, gathering intelligence, and eventually breaking apart the organization in the near future. Very respectfully, the Internal Security Director in Chihuahua, Captain Marco Arenas. Look like Madeira is going off the reservation. And enduring uh, unsuring compliance, my administration has been plagued by labor unrest since its inception, or does wine. We've cracked down hard on the doctors and their interns, but not all of them have given up. I won't allow things to spiral out of control like they did during Kabuki. Fidel Vasquez remained silent. The CTM General Secretary had worked with every past PRI president, and now he seemed to be sizing up the next. What would you have me do, he said at last. I'm going to deal with these doctors once and for all. That will require harsh new anti-strike measures. While this is happening, I will want the CTM and all its workers in lockstep with the government in our narrative. No joining the protest, no sympathy strikes, no talk of solidarity. Velasquez chuckled. Your Excellency, you don't need to worry. My work is no better than to support a bunch of rich doctors and their small bread interns. But just to put your mind at ease, I'll see to it personally that everyone is on their best behavior. Odaz got up to leave, but Velasquez stopped him. I've known this for quite some time, but you're a man of sound judgment. I'm looking forward to a productive six years. Completely disarmed by the compliment, Odaz gave a slight smile. Thank you, Licenciado Velasquez. I feel the same. Cooperation is simple when the priorities align. So right now, we got to keep it at 40 and 20. Which we're already looking actually very, very good. So 26, 6. Decrease both by 5. Mobilize them. So we got a lot of other things we could do here and spend uh, political power. Hopefully we don't need to spend all this stuff because we're actually doing really well already. Um, so I'm actually thinking we don't need to do any of this stuff. So we're actually okay. We need to AMM, AMMRI cooperation. When selected, completing this mission before the timer runs out will cancel its effects. And the effects if not selected, increases radicalism by five, more, get more political power and stability, and then they cooperate, which we don't want. So we need to make sure they don't, don't cooperate. Probably. A toast to the revolution. Is that all then? Laurel asked skeptically. I think it is finally, Madraza replied. The two men smiled at their shared excitement after a month of constant work on the project. The final draft of phase two of their plans was complete. Only a couple of weeks ago, President Ordaza reluctantly authorized the first phase of their plans. Today, these measures have been implemented nationwide, cementing the CM as a true head of the party in the face of local corruption. The fight for the indivisible revolution advances forward. Uh, following the first phase, both worked on perfecting the second. While the first had increased their authority, the second would finally start the reforms. The devil creeping their way into the noble party, limiting its capability to continue the revolution would be stopped. The municipal committees would each conduct a primary to determine who will represent them in the larger states, making the party more accountable and bringing it much closer to the people. Before we send the document, want to open a bottle of tequila? Madrazo proposed. This is a mon moment to celebrate. Definitely, my friend, we deserve this. Madrazo poured the beverage into two small glasses and sat down. They both raised their glasses and down their drinks. After all their hard work, they definitely needed this. They cherished a the moment. Nice. No cooperation between these two groups. And we're still on the third strike. Plain spoken. Ooh. Ah, it's prevented. If not completed, good. By mid morning, the market score is already packed. Jose Alvarez pushed his way through the crowd, making his usual rounds. Every vendor he came to greeted by him, greeted him by name. He didn't consider any of them his friends, but he'd be coming here almost every day for well over a decade. When he first arrived in Mexico City, with barely more than the clothes on his back, he found a work in a mill. That lasted until a miller's union demanded to do money he didn't have. He'd worked a series of odd jobs and been dismissed just as quickly as he was until hired by La Gloria restaurant, where he'd become the food buyer. The restaurant owner was good to him, and repaid that kindness by never missing a day of work. It was the same kind of honest living that suited him just fine. This kind of son seemed unable to hold down. Jose was in line for the fruit stall going over his daily expenses when he noticed the people ahead of him weren't moving. Looking up, he soon realized why. I swear, said a tall woman to the person in front of her, I've known for years that her union was lousy, but the meeting yesterday was just awful. They all but demanded we support the government's new measures, saying local workers had, or loyal workers, had nothing to fear. And when Valeria, who's a cousin's a doctor, asked if she could attend an AWM rally, they gave her the coldest glare I'd ever seen. Can you believe it? Yes, obviously, Jose grumbled, walking past the oblivious woman. The unions don't help their members at all. They're a trap another twelve thieves. Their leaders get rich while the workers suffer. Jose purchased a crate of melons and left without another word. How rude, remarked the woman to her companion, but he's not wrong. Northern Harmony. Uh, did I read this one earlier? Maybe I did. Our America's been a closest partner in the world ever since relations were normalized after the end of the Maximato. Many countries are closer to us culturally, but none have such strong ties of prosperity and mutual interest with us as Americans do. The President of Mexico, however, has observed that we could do more to strengthen these bonds. Working with the United States government and leveraging his own prior with the American intelligence community, President Diaz Ordaz will push to ease restrictions on the border. A freer border will mean freer trade, and freer trade will mean greater economic growth. Thus, a fraternal relationship between the U.S. and Mexico will become stronger. 
Acknowledge Dr. Issues. A one? That's not bad. That? That's not bad at all. I like it a lot. Open for business. Gentlemen, your smiling faces will make it all worth it. Uh, former President Lopez Mateos declared to a crowd of stiff-faced businessmen the grand opening of the Melquar Ocampo Port in Michoacan was fast approaching. Diplomats had decided that Mateos, because of his vital role in organizing the port's creation, should host a pre-opening celebration for the business representatives that flood the port with more than seawater. Japanese Ibatsus, American CEOs, and Mexican industrials gathered in loose groups in the new warehouse. Mateos looked over at the crowd. The local team had done an excellent job with the decorations and refreshments. But even if the men in their fancy suits agreed with him, they didn't show up, even his joke only produced a small number of smiles. I, of course, jest, Mateos continued. I assure you that this port will be self-evident in its worth. The profits you and Mexico will see will be great. It was only then that Mateos saw smiles twist into concrete faces of his audience. I must thank you all. First, to my Japanese and American friends, foreign investment is a vital part of Mexican national development. Mateos received a series of nearly identical smug nods. Gentlemen, Mateos gestured out to open warehouse doors and onto the port beyond. This port and city may be beautiful pieces of engineering, but it's only the beginning. Importing the latest industrial tools and machinery will expand Mexico's manufacturing sector, which will give as much as we receive with this great portal. Mateos couldn't help but bring a grandeur to a speech that went wholly unappreciated by the hard men around him. Mexico's natural bounty will foster much growth for our partners abroad. Thus, the cycle will continue growing each step, and it all began here. Mateo stepped down from the stage and entered the crowd. He would shake hands and schmooze the foreigners and countrymen, and never favoring one group over the other, and patrol the crowd until they beamed with pride over an accomplishment they were forced to aid him. If only they could smile for Mexico's sake alone. Today, a new door opens to Mexico. Look at that! More base stimulation, great. American business and sphere business will rise, and influence will somewhat increase too. Choosing the bait, well, chasing the sun. The foremost task of the Secretary of Industry and Commerce was to understand the current state of the economy. As Octaviano Campos Salas read through the dozens of reports, Newspapers and data sheets, one thing became clear. Japanese investment was, of course, stagnant. What did you expect from me? I know Japan just went through a major economic crisis, but their wanting interest in, or waning interest in Mexico could ripple or growth, or cripple it. Um, he announced to his office staff, let's hear some ideas. <clears throat> one of his assistants said, four, what if we ignore the Japanese in court foreign inf investment elsewhere? President Ordaz clearly prefers to trade with the U.S. anyways. Campo side, uh, uh, I agree with the president on that, but I'm not sure the Americans will offer us enough to fill in the gaps. How about a subsidy package? That said another. If they don't like the economic climate here, we can tip the scales in the favor. They're probably enough to win them back, Campos Salas replied, but it's going to be very popular, both with the public and the Americans. As Campos Salas considered the proposal, he had an idea of his own. Real Salinas Lozano had developed a network of contacts in Japan's largest corporations. Salinas usually wanted to see Ordaz fall, but these were special circumstances. Surely he'd be willing to help with the nation's prosperity was on the line. Where are we at with the Mexican miracle? Japan's influence is it's not bad. A few indictments will get the young flowing. Mm, I'm okay with this. Because with this, we can get more growth and construction speed. Not much, but still. The general defeat. Alfonso Corona de Rosal sat in front of his phone, hoping for an update about the situation in Oaxaca. It would have been easy to negotiate with some, someone reasonable, like a landowner, but thanks to Echeveria, there was no longer possible. Now we had to find some way of convincing indigenous peasants to give up drilling rights. Oh boy. When a call finally came from Del Rosal, he immediately picked it up. General Del Rosal, this is Jesus Reyes Heroles. I'm calling about the land outside Salino Cruz. Director Heroles, it's good to hear from you. Have your men made contact with the Ejido? How are negotiations going? Uh, the Pemex director sighed. My man found the village, but the situation is complicated. Apparently, the place has been added to promotional maps of the south and is flooded with tourists. Tourists? You can't be serious. It's true, I'm told buses of confused Yankees are arriving every day. It's a bit of a mess, but the village is now in Bolton, and there's no chance of a loss of drill there now. I'm sorry, General. Del Rosal slammed the phone down in frustration. After months of work, everything had fallen apart at the last minute. He cursed a scheming snake who had ruined his plans and made expanding Pemex operations much harder. For once, we chose people over petroleum. Oof. Choosing the bait. After careful consideration, Ordaz announced as close as his advisors, I decided to get Earl Chutu out of the federal district by offering him a promotion. Now I need somebody else where to send him. Luis Echeverria scratched his chin. How about making him ambassador to Canada? As a sufficiently prestigious post that will keep him far away from domestic politics. It's prestigious, counter Emilio Martinez Manatal, but I don't think the inflexible iron region will make a good diplomat. Echeverria wanted to say, That's never stopped us before, but held his tongue and steadied about what do you have in mind? So then I'll make use of his obvious talent for construction and planning. Perhaps a post at the Agency for Federal Roads and Bridges? Kapafupe, uh, Kapufi, could be a man, could use a man with his experience. Ordaz was silent, but his face crunched with thought. At length, he relaxed and said, You both give me good options, but I decided to who? An immovable object. Well, that doesn't sound good, does it? Give him the position. We're gonna invest. We're gonna pay that debt off. Look at that. Oh, so much worse now. 
Oh, okay, buddy's having a coup. Yeah, this is bloodless, supposedly. Freedom trackers. They come bearing gifts. Uh, Derek was all smiles as he led the slate of Dodge Year tractors towards uh, you, you As a boy, I'd always dreamed of helping in the fight against fascism, but being a Mennonite pacifist meant the army wasn't an option. He'd been enjoyed, overjoyed to find a job with one of the State Department's aid programs, especially when you learn to be in the field rather than behind a desk. Now he's out here making a difference, delivering top of the line farm equipment to the peasants of Central Mexico. As he watched American aid workers dismount the tractor and approach, Hector's face was a mix of confusion and dismay. What was Ordaz thinking, letting Yankees into the heartland of the revolution? Do you not remember the War of 1846, the punitive expedition, President Dewey's fury during the oil nationalization? Seeing his boss's obvious distress, Benito decided to take the initiative. Thank you for the tractors, he said respectfully. We're very grateful for your assistance. Derek smiled wisely and reached out for a handshake. That's no trouble at all. We're always happy to help out a neighbor in need. My co-worker and I will be staying in Mexico for a few more weeks. If you'd like to help, we can help with the distribution. That will not be necessary, actor suddenly snapped. Foreigners like you cannot possibly assist with such a delicate task. You have no knowledge of the land and its people. The distribution may be handled by my qualified CNC officials, such as myself and my colleague. Derek was taken aback by the refusal, but recovered quickly. Of course, I didn't mean to question your professionalism. I'll leave it to you, then. Goodbye and good luck. They can buy Ordaz's trust, but not ours. Money trees. Our loyal bul bulwark. Assigned to an Art Arctica. Legislative approach. The promise I've made to the people are not limited by any condition. Worker power will decrease. The military option. Periousness will increase. Power of the DFS will increase. Worker, worker power will decrease. Well, let's take a look at where we're at. Honestly, it doesn't matter for that too much. DFS is fully loyal to us for now. Peasant Street's not bad. We've, so far, came out of this not too bad. So it really doesn't matter either one. Military option. Significantly increase. We get more command power. Um, I kind of want to go with the legislative approach. The legislature operates entirely according to the directions of the Institutional Revolutionary Party. Also, critics whine and call us a puppet legislature, whether they're onto something or just onto something. Uh, some, to, on something or just on something, the legislature is certainly useful for the purpose of defeating strikes and strikers. Leveraging the legislature to pass law projects enables to strangle vic strikes via legalism, which is more effective in the long term than simply giving them the stick as they deserve, however. If this measures to work out as we envision, we need to have enough control over the pure right to avoid the worst of the bureaucratic stagnation that even President Ordaz has complained about before. Moreover, we must accept that it will be a slower route in general than simply applying force. One, two, not bad. Three, five, I'll go to one, one for five. Eh, we're running out of political power, not good. Um, a siege of Sabadella. The barracks stink of sweat. Uh, sweat of rural police, sweat of townspeople, and the ruffians and thugs and the cocky cues had hired are the two mighty landowners themselves, Emilio Rascon and Florentino Ibarra. But on this noonday sun, none were sweating more than Solomon, the mayor of the small town of Chihuahua, as he clambered atop the pile of furniture. Maria Martinez, pistol in hand, managed to join him. A hundred eyes, ninety glasses with hunger, rested on the duo. Cibadella has always been a poor place, but these peep days have been sinking to new depths of desperation. The Grupo Popular Gorillero have defeated the 67th Infantry Battalion and now sit on the only road out of town. You may ask what hope we have for victory. Mayor Salomon's voice quavered for a moment. But the voice of Salomon Gaetan rang out true and firm. But a victory far greater lies within our grasp. Citizens of Cibadala, the GPG are not our enemy. These men are the ones who feasted as you starved, who robbed you, who beat you for years. You have sworn to protect this town. You turn your arms on those who ravage it, not those who have come to save it. Fifty Mines. Dulled with exhaustion world, but the hands that moved first were those of Maria, who loosened a bullet into the arm of Emilio Rascon, shouting Viva la Revolucion. At the signal, all heck broke loose. The GPG columns, led by Salvador Gaetan, began charging towards Cebedilla, firing into the air and whooping. Solomon and Maria died for cover as rural police and townsfolk turned on the numerous henchmen and cadillos. Ibarra turned to flee, but was tackled to the ground by an officer. For a moment, blood flowed freely before the Caquequeus forces joined in a course of surrender and the cause of reform. Ooh. Interesting. In total, following the recent purges, uh, 1,125 elections will need to be arranged. Ordaz read aloud, incredulous. The number on the document was inconceivable. The consequences of these purges would be unfathomable. Madrazo was betraying the president's trust after they had been all they'd been through. Carlos Madrazo was definitely someone you shouldn't take lightly. To some, it was a pretty idealist with irrational goals, while others viewed him as a spearhead of the reformist movement and the person that could bring the PRI into the future. For President Ordaz, however, it was neither. For him, Madrazo was his gateway to the reformists in the party, and through that alliance, a friendship had been created. Through everything from the Nava debacle to the doctor's strike, he'd been able to rely on Madrazo when he needed public support. He was a great man, but this breaking of mutual confidence was a step in the wrong direction. 
<laughs> really, what was he thinking? As a companion, Laura Ortega seems smart enough, but when the two worked together on reforms, the old guard establishment could rarely stem the consequences. 1125 primary elections was just not something the party had the capacity to handle. They would lurch from the stable system with experienced officials to an unstable one full of inexperienced idealists. Taking a deep breath, Ordaz calmed his nerves. Even Madrazo sometimes got out of a bit of control. He was still both his friend and his way to reach reformists. He shouldn't start questioning his judgment now, or Ordaz valued stability in the national unity more than anything. So long as Madrazo and Ortega didn't threaten those things, he wouldn't let their work trouble him too much. The work continues, though. And then a storm from the north. Pinching the bridge of his nose, Octaviano Campos Salas wondered just what he was thinking when he decided to subsidize Japanese companies. Investments from the sphere was up, but at the cost of a significant American backlash. Now his office was being floated with phone calls from angry businessmen and American newspapers were calling him a Japanese stooge. Something had to be done. Putting his glasses back on, he looked over the response plans prepared by his staff. The first plan proposed guaranteeing the American companies equal treatment. In other words, they would receive any and all inductments their Japanese counterparts receive. It was bound to be popular up north, but he wondered if Mexico could afford giving special privileges to so many foreign firms. Flipping to the second plan revealed a more modest subsidy package. American businesses already enjoyed an advantageous position in Mexico, and much of the outrage was overblown. He thought they would probably accept these smaller inductments with only a bit of grumbling. As Campos Salas shuffled both pans around his desk, part of him wondered if they were looking at all this wrong. The U.S. had always enjoyed special economic privileges in Mexico, and whenever the Mexicans invited others into counterbalance the Americans, they protested. Past Mexican governments had folded under the pressure, but maybe now it sounds finally like stand. Equal treatment is only fair. A few inductments keep them quiet. You're done enough to pay for, the, pay for the Yankees. Well, where are we at with, the, with this? 25 out of 25. Keep them quiet. Liberty and fraternity. I want to invest that money. There you go. I'm home, Miguel called out, hitting a betting slip from his wall, from pocket. I had to work late again. Lena was looking thinner and paler than usual smile when she saw him. Three-year-old Rosita was already asleep on the bed that took up most of their tiny room. Despite his size, he'd been lucky to find the spice after his father threw him out. Slowly making his way over the radio, Miguel turned it on at a low volume. Major news out of the United States today where lawmakers are considering terminating the Bracero program. The word Bracero instantly brought back a flood of memories. Hedgehacking across a scorching desert. To reach the border, a day spent slipping outside, waiting, hoping. Which was come under fire from the American Labor Union. In the end, the Senate narrowly improved a one-year extension of the program. Ambassador Hugo B. Maragain praised the move, calling it proof of the brotherly solidarity between our two nations. Miguel began to laugh. The memories continued being crammed into the ramshackle lodgings with 16 other men with no protection from the flies and mosquitoes, spending all day beneath the blazing sun his hands were cut to ribbons by the plants, watching men collapse from exhaustion, eating spoiled food that sometimes made men sick. Every complaint met with the same retort, if you don't like it, go back. His laugh grew stronger, more cynical. Elena looked concerned. Truthfully, he had enjoyed his time in the States, but and some of the people he'd met there had been very friendly, but of all the crappy bosses he had, the Yankee overseer is by far the worst. How could anyone call such mistreatment brotherly solidarity? Will they ever see us as equals? Establish an ASA, but an immovable object. And I think there's no one better suited for the position than you, Licenciado Earl Chortu. President Ordaz said in an arrogant tone, You've done well in this city, now all your talents you need elsewhere. The Iron Region stared at Ordaz, uh, barely able to conceal his disdain. His opinion of the president had reached a new low. Your Excellency replied through his gritted teeth, I see what this is. Ordaz raised an eyebrow, what do you, whatever do you mean? This promotion is little more than an insult. You're trying to force me out, or Earl Chortu. Uh, Earl Chortu said, almost yelling, you only gone so you can destroy everything I've built here in the federal district. Sorry, but I'm not, not going to work. Mexico City is where I belong. You dare defy me again, Ordaz growled, his face contorted into a frightening visage. For a moment, he seemed ready to explode right back at Earl Chortu. But the moment passed. Ordaz's rage cooled into a harder, more dispassionate contempt. You're dismissed from office, effective immediately. There will be no promotion. So long as I'm president, you'll never receive another government job, not even the post office clerk. Get out of here and don't come back. Well, what could have been? We try to give him an out. But establish ASA. The airport crisis has been bedeviling us for some time now. We take it in the form of decisive action in order to ensure the Mexicans can travel in peace. Fortunately, a very interesting proposal has been placed in front of us. That of the establishment of the Aeropuertos e Servicios Auxiliares, Airport and Auxiliary Service, ASA for short. To resolve the ongoing airport crisis, we'll have the ASA resume responsibility for the majority of Mexican airports. This will enable it to better regulate the industry, invest in it, and expand it as appropriate. That'd be great to do. But, like I said, we gotta do uh, this one first. Yeah. Extend Gil Preciado's leash. I'd like to do this one. How much uh, do we have here? Ooh, we're still at this 32%. Oh, yeah, May. Yeah, that's good growth. Uh, it's, not, it's not bad, but we could have better. Deficit's not okay. Flooding the shadows. Late in the evening, the Hotel Geneve. 
Men and suits crowd into an evening event hall. Officially, they were there for a PRI party reunion, but the guests had said some unusually big names. Several sitting governors were in attendance, as there were many high-ranking party officials. Others who couldn't make it had rep sent representatives in their place. Leopoldo Sanchez Celes, Governor Sinaloa, was the first to speak. Carlos Madraz was becoming a real problem. His so-called reforms are just a naked power grab at our expense. For once, I agree with Leopoldo. The Chihuahua governor, Praxedes Duran. His anti-corruption purges have targeted some of my best subordinates, most didn't even do anything out of the ordinary. If you think that's bad, added Adolfo Martinez Dominguez, president of the Chap Chamber of Deputies, you should see what he's done here in the federal district. Gentlemen, we've already understand the problem, said an unassuming man. We should be discussing solutions. The room fell silent. On the surface, the man was just a minor CTM official, but everyone knew he represented Fidel Vasquez Sanchez, the CTM's infamous general secretary. Well, that's easy enough, replied Sanchez Celis. We governors should be resisting Madrazo's plans tooth and nail. Let him fight on everything until he gives up or Ordaz is forced to replace him. Martinez Dominguez set up straight. Here in the capital, we can try another angle of attack. I'll do something to show how dangerous these reforms really are. Madrazo has made many enemies. Can't get anywhere without making some enemies. It's a thought that counts. Derek steady. His nerves as he picked up the hotel phone and asked to be connected to his boss in Washington. He'd never been good at delivering bad news, but that was all he had to report. His return trip to Morelos was supposed to be a simple affair. Interviewing a few grateful peasants, take pictures of them using the shiny new American-made tractors, and said he'd been met with a deluge of complaints. A person saw an Ejido that received only one tractor, while a neighboring Ejido of equal size received five. He explained in an exasperated tone, and peasants all over the region are being charged for a small fortune for spare parts. Um, well, those are supposed to be free. Derek swallowed hard. Corruption, that's the only way I can explain it. Local officials are dispersing all of our aid in the ways that benefit themselves, um, and it's limiting the program's effectiveness. I'd like to lodge a formal complaint or just do something about this. Uh, after a moment of silence, his boss's voice crackled through the receiver. Your job is to give them tractors. The Mexicans can use them as they see fit. Remember that we're doing this to improve relations, not to stir up trouble and potentially cause a diplomatic incident. You best forget about this and come home. As the line went dead, Derek let out a heavy sigh. So much for making a difference. But he put the phone down and started packing his bag. So we got to make sure these people don't ally with each other. So how many freaking strikes are we going to have here? Five days. Can we get this in within a few days? An unexpected announcement. Uh, the Mexican Chamber of Deputies was a fairly tranquil legislative body, with the PRI and his allies controlling over 90% of the seats. Uh, that was hardly surprising. The PAN, uh, the only real opposition party, was powerless to do anything but complain from the sidelines. The president of the Chamber, uh, Alfonso Martinez Dominguez, took the floor unexpectedly after setting his nerves he began to speak. The Mexican Revolution is not over. It is constantly evolving, adapting to a changing society. Some of the rules we once thought essential may no longer be necessary. I would like to formally introduce a constitutional amendment abolishing the one-term limit for members of this body. The PRI congressman stared at Martinez Dominguez in stunned silence. This is not a part of the part planned reforms. Meanwhile, in the PAN section, a cautious optimism was spreading. They stood a benefit from the re-election of the congressman, and they had long been demanding it. Had their prayers finally been answered? When Carlos Mazarazo heard about the amendment, he was furious. He paid a visit to several congressmen, and had the proposal killed off before the end of the day. The crisis was short-lived, but the backlash was intense. The PAN was outraged, and denounced Madrazo was a hypocrite. Many scandalized PRI congressmen considered Madrazo the leader of the reformists and blamed him for the incident. The Southern Cyclones already bruised reputation and taken yet another hit. Every reformist has their moment. We barely got this in time. Labor relations. Disruptive strikes, meaning those which create public disturbances and involve five or more people, shall be prohibited. Finally, all strikes carried out in the industries deemed critical to the well-being of the nation shall be restricted. The willing voice of the president of the Chamber of Dep Deputies echoed throughout the legislative plates of the Damocles, or Donocles. Congressman Mercado's jaw hung open all around him on the lushly carpeted chambered floor and the balconies above and the other deputies stared at him passionately. It was a PPS man true and a radical one at that. He was used to disagreeing with his colleagues, but he could not believe what he saw. Few seemed to share his dismay. The de young deputy stood, the laws in front to. Congressman Mercado returned to your seat. The president thundered he complied. The debate peered his path. If you find yourself opposed to these provisions, cast your ballot as you wish. Congressman Mercado was surrounded by glares and whispers. He sunk deeper into his chair. The president called for them to cast their ballots. The deputies shuffled forward, and the slips of paper disappeared into the ballot box. The final total was grim, 192 yeah to 18 nay. As the rest of the chamber stood and struck up the idle conversations, the PPS congressman sat in stunned silence. Mercado blinked back tears. Outside help. And you're sure we can trust this guy, said Salvador Gaetan, commander of the GPG's second column? I get that youthful enthusiasm is only going to get us so far, but it, all it's going to take is him disappearing over a couple hills, and then we'll have a whole plateau up our butt. Ooh, I like this one too. 
Look, the Mexican city cadre said this guy was legit, said Arturo, and that they trust him, I trust him. Besides, he's not in the army anymore. Dishonorable discharge or something like that. In any case, who else is going to pay for him? We're paying him. I thought we didn't have access to UGOCM funds anymore. Mexico City are. Darn, tuition must be cheaper than I thought, grinned Salvador. Maybe. Um, I should change my ways, get an education, make something of myself, ready to clean up my act, you know? Uh, you need a mop and bucket for that, or I can sit Arturo. Anyways, we're in agreement for taking this guy on. We don't get access to former army captains every day, and half of recruits can't. You figure out which end of a gun and bullet comes from. Salvador said, I guess so, but this doesn't sit right with me. So we need all the help we can get. Little bulwark. Establish your IMP. Only fool would suggest that the Mexican economy functions on anything other than oil. However, major force on unforced error has occurred in all that the oil resources present within Mexican borders have not been properly harnessed and are thus insufficiently exploited. It's a mistake that cannot be permitted to exist. Ordaz shall form the Instituto Mexicano del Petróleo. The Mexican Petroleum Institute or IMP is a central state research body with respect to petroleum. Working with the state oil corporation Pemex, it will improve the technology of extraction and refinement of Mexican oil producers and the nuclear option. After over a month of work, the first round of primacy or primary elections was complete. All the officials were moved, uh, and the Madrazo's purges have been replaced. The process has been ad hoc, and some party members have claimed that they have been rigged, but it was done. Madrazo met Laura Ortega in his office for another celebration. I'm glad we managed to finally pull it off, said Ortega. But the response from within the parties has me a bit worried. Um, opposition to our reforms is growing. Madrazo took a sip of water. So what? We knew from the start that our plans would be unpopular with the parasites. If corrupt carriers suppose us, then we must be doing something right. In that case, what do you think our next move should be? If we go bigger, Madrazo replied with a smile, our first reforms have been successful. It's time to expand them. All local government officials should be selected by primaries, along with governors, senators, and congressmen. We're making gains, we shouldn't take our foot off the gas. The two men spent the rest of the afternoon refining the idea. They ultimately agreed on the deadline of 1966 for the implementation of primary elections across the board. A few days later, they made the announcement publicly. Panic spread throughout the party, which is not good. But I think I'll end it there. We're doing alright. The unions are trying to gain more momentum, but uh, they're not doing so hot. So, I mean, we're doing alright overall. Like, economically, we could be doing a lot worse. So, if you enjoyed the video, please consider leaving a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below. And I'll see you tomorrow, as it might potentially be our last episode playing as Mexico for now. Thanks for watching, and have a great rest of your day.